Hi, I'm here today uh, with Tracy Martin from New Zealand First talking about tertiary education. Um, so Tracy, it's great to have your time in a very busy week. Um, obviously the first thing that we wanted to just chat about was um, the bill that's been before the House, the Education Amendment Bill, um, and the, the push to further privatise tertiary education. And we wondered, you know, where does New Zealand First stand on that bill? Well, with the other opposition parties, with Labour and the Greens basically saying no. Um, there's, there's probably there's three things particularly inside that bill that concern us, but the biggest one is the inability, so this, what that bill wants to do, what the national government wants to do, is to tie the hands of any future government from being able to fund either public or private at a higher level to make sure that we can get the provision. Um, and that would, can only be driven from conversations with the private providers who are afraid that quite rightly, a government would go back to funding its public education sector at a higher level to make sure that we have a backbone of public, public provision. So um, I have been trying to talk with um, members of the National Party to get them to understand that it binds them as well. And, um, and you know, trying to get them to see that it's, it's, there's no need to do this. They're currently paying everybody the same. So why do you need, basically they're trying to stop the Labour Party from, from um, publicly funding education. So why is it so important to have publicly funded education for you know for New Zealand First for you? Why do you think it's um, look? It's the backbone of any true democracy. Um, it's the first thing that gets under attack uh, by a government or um, or business that wants to make profit out of the public purse. Um, and we've seen that with charter schools, where in this country and in other countries, we've seen how, and let's just take Myanmar for example, where I went a few years ago, one of the first things that anybody, any military dictatorship or whatever does is they attack your public education system. So you need a strong public education system with an independent voice, because they're part of the critic of a government. Um, but they're also what makes sure that everybody, is, it's a leveller for your society. Um, because choice is only available to those who can afford it. And, and I mean, that's a really important um, fact for, for our membership, um, is, is accessibility of education. So the choice mm. thing being that you actually then need a government to put some energy into thinking about where we provide what we provide, mm. Mm. and to having an overview, particularly in small communities. So right. you know, communities like Timaru, communities like Gisborne, yeah. communities like um, Whangarei, where mm. you know we've seen underfunding of the sector really harm the polytechnic. So yeah. where does New Zealand first stand on regional provision of, you know, of well, education? Well, you're, you're right, and I mean, and that's part of the um, part of the sort of network mapping plan that we want to have a look at is where is that provision because I think network mapping has gone out the door um, we've seen it with ECE and we've seen it with tertiary so there's no there's no requirement for say a private provider to actually say oh there's a need here they just say well there's a course that we can see at a polytech for example it's got a lot of people in it so there's an opportunity for us to skim some of those people off and make a bit of money so from that from that perspective we'd like to see a complete network provision mapping similar to um, what we believe well, what goes on in the public um, education system at primary and secondary. And that way we believe we can strengthen politics and make sure that we've got that sort of secondary tier um, provision inside our regions. But then we also believe that there is a market for private providers further out. Um, and they need to, they may need to be incentivised to actually make sure that, you know, kids on the Kafia coast and all that sort of thing get access to post-secondary education. So as, as part of that obviously is the whole question of what do students get um, when you know, mm -hmm. New Zealand First is in a coalition government, um, because our students are struggling. Oh, they're living yeah. in poverty, they're living yeah. in hardship, they're living in terrible housing, mm -hmm. um, you know, they can't afford health care, all yeah. those things. So what's in it, you know, yeah. this election? And, uh, and I mean you neglected to mention that just the mental health issues that are happening, the stresses that are on. So I mean you know I was a debt collector. So. Um, my real drive is this ridiculousness of having our next generation sort of weighed down, crushed by 15 to 17 billion dollars worth of student debt. So um, I came up with the upfront investment tertiary policy, took it to our um, caucus and got it approved to be the main educational platform for New Zealand First. So that would completely wipe out student debt, it's completely wipe out student loans. Uh, we will do away with StudyLink. It costs us 715 million dollars a year to administer StudyLink to get our young people into debt. So we're going to take that all away um, and we're going to put in workforce skills planning which this government removed four years ago. We're going to um, professionalise the careers and transition advice for life 
because people are going to have to move and change with different um, professions. We're going to have educational entry, a comp competition at educational entry, which is what the Finns do. Um, and we're introducing things like the Business Linked Internship Scheme, which is a precursor to, say, apprenticeships or po further post-secondary. We're going to do a universal student allowance that is not parentally means tested because you either believe in supporting education in this country or you don't. Um, and we're going to actually make sure that students have access to the accommodation supplement like any other New Zealander if they meet the criteria. Um, the weirdest thing this government did was decide that students are lesser citizens when it comes to their living conditions and so just even if you meet the criteria just because you're a student we're not going to give you the full accommodation supplement. So th those are the sort of things that we're hoping to implement. So, so plenty there for students to think about as they um, hopefully head to the polls in the next yeah, well, two weeks. I hope they do have a really good think about it and I think the first thing that comes back is people say it's unaffordable and that's been the brainwashing of the last 25 years. The, our policy is at 1.86, 1.87% of GDP. This government's only spending 1.67% of GDP at the moment, but they used to spend 2.9% of GDP back in 2009. So one, yes they've cut funding, and two, it's fully affordable to actually do what we're saying. Real choices in the selection are certainly something we're seeing. There's lots of discussion about, you know, people have got some real choices to make. One, I guess, for university staff, that's really, really important, but also Polytechnic and Wananga staff because they have this around their teaching, is our ability to express academic freedom, mm. to be the critic in conscience, to actually get out there and do our core role yeah. uh, rather than focusing on some of the auditing and uh, compliance that's yeah. been foist upon us in the market model. So, you know, have you mm. been thinking about those issues when you've talked to staff? It, it's across the whole of the education sector though. It's a low trust model. That's what this government has perpetuated onto the education system. We don't trust you as teachers to care enough to actually do right by your students. And, and the success markers are boxes on a page as opposed to what is, is that human being um, successful in their own right? And what does success look like for that human being, for that student? And that's part of that education conversation we want to have um, across the whole of education from the cradle to the grave, set a 30 year strategic plan in the same way that Finland did. And we need to get politicians up out of the classroom and return to a high trust model. You guys are professionals. I don't go, the politicians don't wander into a um, into an operating room and tell them how to do that. So do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. It, it, we've got to shift from this really low trust model back to high trust and, and let you guys, you guys care for your students. That's why you went into the profession, because it certainly wasn't for the money. No, no and certainly <laughs> our, our members absolutely do care and they care about the professional integrity. Mm. And you're right, mm. we need to get some trust back in yeah. there. So, so some, some great choices there. And I think the other thing too is that some of the perverse um, incentives that have been put in there are actually, there's a push um, on, our, on our teaching body to manipulate figures to come up with outcomes mm. that either um, a provider wants or the government wants. Now that's inappropriate. And so the stress on our tutors and our teaching profession to deliver the numbers as opposed to deliver for the student, um, we have got to switch that up. Absolutely. So it's certainly an election where we can think about returning mm -hmm. A, some power and control to the professions, but also caring about the kids yeah. and the students we teach who, of course, is yeah. anybody at any time in their life. So, you know, you've, you've clearly for us articulated some stuff about keeping it public, keeping it local, yeah. um, and actually keeping it accessible for our yeah. students. So yeah. thank you very much for all the hard work and good luck on the track. Thank you. <laughs>